get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bar, P90X, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business, John Corcoran, who Jordan is also good friends with. Rise25, we host in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country. We've hosted them in the past couple of years in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas, more I'm missing. So if you see the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate to get your business to the next level, go to rise25.com and contact us to find out when and where our next event is going to be. And Jordan was actually at the first event we ever did. And uh, we accomplished, I think, a lot right. in a six hour time period. You remember that? That was a crazy event, man. First of all, thanks for having me on. But yeah, that event, that was crazy. I remember going there and just sitting in this room with a bunch of people that were all awesome and going, this is a really good idea, but I'm getting kind of hungry. But then I don't know what it was. I don't know if we didn't have break time like woven into it, but we had a bunch of cans of like La Croix or La Croix, La Croix as we say in Michigan, but La Croix, those, those waters. And then like a billion granola bars or nuts or something. I don't know. It's been like four years, five years. And I remember I was sitting next to the stack of snacks. And pro tip, if you are on a diet, never sit next to the stack of snacks at an event. And I just remember one after the other after the other. I was just housing it. And at the end, everyone's like, we're so hungry. We haven't eaten all day. And I'm like, I'm good. I'm full. I can't do it. I couldn't stuff anything else in here. That was just one of the many glitches of our first event. <laughs> but um, I want to formally... Hey, at least you had snacks. Yeah, exactly. So I want to formally introduce you, Jordan. Um, Jordan Harminger is a Wall Street lawyer turned talk show host, social dynamics expert and entrepreneur. After hosting a top 50 iTunes podcast for over a decade that had nearly 4 million downloads a month, with guests like Shaquille O'Neal, it was all taken away. Except for one thing, actually, Jordan, uh, the relationships, which we're going to talk about, and that was huge. Uh, Jordan's interviews can be found on the Jordan Harbinger Show, where he deconstructs the playbooks of the most successful people on earth and shares their strategies and insights with the rest of us. So check it out at jordanharbinger.com. And they are meticulous about creating great content. And so you will find that on the Jordan, you know, the Jordan Harbinger show. Um, and on the personal side, Jordan speaks five languages, traveled through war zones. He's been kidnapped twice. We're probably not going to be talking about that because he's told the story so many times. But but it's crazy. And yeah. he met his wife because of the podcast. So Jordan, thank you for joining right. me. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me on, man. You're always always looking out for me, and I appreciate that. You are a living embodiment of someone who practices what they preach as far as the relationship stuff is concerned. So I appreciate well, that. Well, thank you. John and I will do whatever, whenever we can for you and for your show because you know because of who you are and and what you do. So um, I you know obviously there's a lot of questions around what happened, what are you doing to rebuild, but. Um, I wanted to start off about talking about first how Jen is the best, okay, and how she's impacted the business. Yeah. Um, how she's impacted the business because she's helped a lot on a lot of different fronts. Um, and I want to hear too about what she does not like about your interviews and what she does like about your interviews because she helps kind of curate that. So talk to me first about how Jen has impacted the business. Sure. So you're talking about my wife, Jen. Your wife, Jen. Yes. Uh, and it's funny. It's funny that you're bringing that up because she really does impact the business a lot. And I feel like at first I thought this question was a little bit of a joke, but it's it's true. Having somebody that works Not really closely joke. with you, whether it's a partner, yeah, whether it's a partner uh, like your wife or significant other that you that you live with, or or if it's a business partner. Having a relationship where someone can give you honest feedback and you're not going to get mad or petty or jealous or annoyed 
is actually something that I'm not used to having in my business. Before, when I worked for uh, other companies, I couldn't give director honest feedback because there would always be some sort of like, oh, okay, thanks for telling me. And then two days later, that person's mad at me for something else, but it really just, they're starting to get their feelings hurt. And it's actually a, a really tough road to grow a business because you realize that at some level, giving honest feedback is not worth it because you're paying for it personally later on. Totally. And so when, when you're working with a business partner or, or especially when that person's a significant other, you really do have to balance feedback with Brutally honest your, feedback, right? your personal relationship. Yeah. yeah, I'll give you an example. The other day, it was probably like two o'clock in the morning. We'd just gotten off of a long flight that had been delayed for like three or four hours. Usually we go to bed at like 9.30. We'd just gotten back. We had an early morning. I was really frustrated with that. And right before we hop into bed, Jen goes, you know, I didn't really like the questions that you asked on this interview. It seemed a little disorganized and we're going to have to figure out how to clean it up. And I went, you know, now is not the time for brutally honest feedback. You know, you could give that to me in the morning. And yeah. I got I kind of like I got upset about it. And then she's like, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to improve the quality of the show. And I was like, I know, but you know, it's really irritating. And so I, then I, that's when we sort of both stopped and laughed about it because she was really just telling me something that she had probably just remembered in the moment. And I thought, right. you couldn't have told me this eight hours ago when I was coherent, you know, at it's the totally moment. It's totally the and, timing and ready to take this in. Yeah. Totally the timing. Totally the timing of it. The feedback was completely valid. And after she said it, and after I flew off the handle, I immediately went like, oh, actually, you know, you're right. This could have been better. We're going to have producer Jason clean it up in post-production as best we can. Thanks for noticing. In the meantime, you know, maybe give me a signal during the show that will help me clean it up. Uh, I'll try to keep an eye on it. But having somebody like that who can give you brutally honest feedback and also you have to play your part in managing the relationship. Because yeah. I know a lot of husband-wife pairs that work together. I also know a lot of business partners that work together and they say they're great for brutally honest feedback, but often they're really not. Right? They say they can do that. They say that's a thing they're both comfortable with, but really they're both kind of walking on eggshells or at least dancing around certain elephants in the room because they know that it's not worth getting into a fight over some sensitive subject. Yeah. And that's normal for any relationship, but it can become a problem in a business. And there's no better brutally honest feedback than from your wife. I mean, no one else, I mean, I don't want no one else, but most people, if I do something, my wife is like on it instantaneously like why are you doing that or why do you look like that why are you wearing that but um from jen's you know i was listening on a, to another interview that you did and she and you had mentioned that she thought the interview you did with john corcoran was you were too emotional and you should have and i i actually love the the one you did with john corcoran so but i'm wondering what other brutally honest feedback has she given you um either recently or in the past that is really helped improve and I don't think anyone else Jordan would notice that except for people who are just looking through the fine tooth comb because you do meticulously create your the research and the content behind this stuff. Yeah, that's true. So what else is um, she brutally, brutally honest, honest feedback? The organization Yeah, the organization and structure of the interviews themselves and she's really she's she loves story based shows. So she's listening to these true crime shows. She's listening to uh, news shows that where they tell stories in a certain way uh, to keep people interested. I'm more interview based. So my show is Charlie Rose, Larry King, whereas a lot of the shows she's listening to mm. are more the moth. Right. And the feedback is still really valid because she doesn't expect me to turn an interview with someone like you or Vanessa Van Edwards into the moth. But what she does expect is for the content to be arranged in a way that it flows naturally in your head. Whereas I'm just trying to get content, 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 humor and entertainment, content, content, content. She's like, well, this piece should go here and this piece should go there because I'm gonna do this first and then it's gonna get me thinking about this and then that and then this and then, and I'm thinking, wow, okay. You know, it sounds a little nitpicky, but if, if her brain works like that, then that means there's a lot of listeners whose brains probably work like that. And I don't want people to have to go backwards to go forwards. I want people to think this is a linear progression, linear learning, because it, it takes away some of the cognitive resources required to remember 
the topics at hand, to apply the topics at hand. And that's what you want when you're teaching. So I figure if I can teach someone like her who's not – doesn't consider herself – you know, a body or brain hacker or a networker or some kind of entrepreneur. If I could teach her these skills, then somebody who is really interested in this stuff and a fan of the Jordan Harbinger show for the content pieces are really going to be interested and we're going to keep their attention as well. So that, that was a piece of brutal feedback, sort of the flow of the show, um, the topics involved in the show. There's actually some brutal, brutal feedback yeah, where I discard it and I think yeah. I'm better off for it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, the show topics. So we did a recent episode with uh, Simon Sinek, which is a big hit, uh, and it was about finding your why and all this. You know, Simon Sinek is sort of famous for that. Yep. I did another episode with Jocko Willink, Navy SEAL, about discipline, and I did another episode with uh, a brain scientist, David Eagleman, about how your brain makes sense of the world and how your senses work in your brain. And she thought, well, there's not very many practicals in this, but it is interesting. And then – Contrast that with another episode that I did about money laundering with a, a guy who – Joshua Fruth who tracks money around the world and tracks international criminal organizations. And that was kind of an overview of money laundering. It had no practicals. And when she was listening to it in studio, she hated it. And then when she listened to the final cut, she really enjoyed it. Hmm. So there's a lot of different topics that she really didn't like at first that she really turned out to like later on. But she's very much trying to keep me on Why track was because – you, what? Why, hand, what? why didn't she like it? Why did she not like it in the beginning, but liked it later on? Um, because I find like there was no practical. I would find that would fit more with what she likes, which is more maybe story based. Why did she not like it at first? Exactly. Exactly. I think she saw that the guest was really referring to a lot of dense written material during the show, which isn't helpful for a talk show conversation format. Mm. However, he was a little nervous, and he'd never done a show before. So I wanted to give him his, you know, written content outline as a security blanket. Yeah. I probably won't do that again. But my producer Jason, who you know, yeah, who li- lives in Chicago and is moving literally today, and where is he moving? The, and the rest of the week over to L.A. To L.A. He's moving he back got to LA. smart. It's because it snowed in Chicago a couple of year, a couple of days ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I'm out. I knew he'd be. So I knew he'd last like less than a year. He was able to cut it out. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how long he's been yeah. there. It's got to be at least a year, maybe two, but he's, yeah, he's over He it. got smart. That's fine. Yeah. So she was able to cut or find that the topics when they're produced are, are more interesting to her. And I think the reason that these things are important to her is because she wants to make sure that the content of the show really is the best out there and retains the listener. Because when we look at the first month, the Jordan Harbinger show, we, we had 1.4 million downloads the first month. That's amazing. Congratulations. And That's awesome. When we, well, thank you. I appreciate it. And when we look at the old show, you know, at its peak, we're looking at around 4 million downloads a month. So we're already well on our way to catching up even after, I think it's been about two months or so of the Jordan Harbinger show. And we're on, you know, 27, 28 episodes as of this recording. So it's going to be probably 40 by the time this thing comes out. But she wants to make sure that the old audience finds us and sticks and that new listeners find us and they stick too. And so, that, and of course, that's why I would love it if people from Inspired Insider go over and listen to the Jordan Harbinger show. For sure. But the truth is Jen and I have this mantra that every minute of the listener's time for the show is earned. And what that means is that I have to constantly and consistently advocate for the audience. You can't let someone go off on a tangent. You can't start talking about pancakes you know, unless it's funny or to the point or illustrate something, you know, you can't sit there and talk about inside jokes all the time. This is something that she's very sensitive to because she's thinking, what is an outsider who's never, what is an inspired outsider think when they come to the Jordan Harbinger show, are they going to like the content and are they going to stick? Because every person that you get to come and check your stuff out is, is a huge win. And it becomes a loss if that person says, eh, wasn't into it and leaves. Right. So maybe 50 percent of the inspired insider audience will go check out the Jordan Harbinger show and the other half won't. But we want 100 percent of the people that come and check it out to subscribe and stay engaged. But if you do a mediocre job on any show for any length of time, people might say, eh, there's a lot of content out there. I can't be bothered. That's a problem. Totally. That's a big problem. What about talk about the evolution of the content? And I just want to fast forward to today. But I know originally you started off more 
relationship based, um, you know, and it depends on where you're at at that stage of your career. What talk about the content going forward um, and now with the Jordan Harbinger? Because here's the thing: you have a you have a clean slate, right? Which is cool. And, and I thought about this, you know, Jordan. We can go and I could go. Okay, ask about what the heck happened. Like everything, the rug was taken out from under you, and everything was taken out from under you. And then I'm like, who cares? Like, let's talk about forward. But there's some lessons to be learned there. But I yeah. kind of want to start with just moving forward. You're building from scratch, and to you, one of the most important thing, two most important things, is the relationships and the content piece. And so, talk about the content piece for a second. The direction for the Jordan Harbinger show. Sure. So the content piece, this stuff is extremely important because I don't want and didn't want to, I didn't want to simply have some kind of, oh, well, the old show was about dating and relationships. So I guess I'm kind of going to do dating and relationships. It, it, it didn't make any sense. I wanted to, I had to really step back. And since the sunk cost of losing the old show was then gone, or I was I, some cost is not gone. The old show was gone. The sunk cost was already in place. You have to be very cognizant not to just panic and rebuild the same business that you built before with all the faults and all the downsides that you didn't like last time. Yeah. So I was very careful not to simply create the Jordan Harbinger show and go, this is a continuation of this other show that was about dating and relationships that I no longer care about, that I no longer want to be a part of. And that was important to sit down. It was important to sit down with new business partners, new staff, new team and say, what is it that we want? You know, going from here's some tips about body language or here's a person who's a dating coach for online dating. I, I didn't care as much about those episodes. And I so I had to sit down and go, all right, where is the old format been constraining me? Yeah. Uh, where do where have I wanted to go and not been able to go because of either restrictions from my business partners or the format restrictions or what type of of guests am I able to get now that I couldn't have gotten before because of the weird dating related branding that I had on the old show you know the Jordan Harbinger show is named after me which means I can put anything on there that I want so what do I really want yeah. not just do I rebuild and how do I rebuild but what do I rebuild you know do I rebuild something that's gonna make me happy for the next 10 20 years mm -hmm. the obvious answer is yes but sometimes in our haste if we find the rug has been pulled out from underneath us, sometimes in our haste, we'll simply try to rebuild what we had before. But that's kind of like building a really big tanker ship that's going in the wrong direction and then trying to steer it instead of building the ship in the first place aimed in the direction that you want to go. Does that make sense? Totally. And, and I think it's valuable. I mean, this happened. Uh, maybe it was or wasn't like the best thing you felt was the best thing at the time. But I feel like anyone should be doing this in their current business every year, every six months, every four months. Just evaluating, you know, a clean slate. What should, what should I be doing going forward? You know what I mean? Yours just happened to be an extreme example of that. So, so what do you do? So you're you're strategizing on, you know, as you're trying to frantically build the business. What do you do as far as the content goes? Because that's the foundation, right? Sure. So I realized that some of the most popular content that I had of the old show were things that were off topic, so to speak, but that I was personally very interested in. So some of my first episodes, one was from a crisis management leader. So with the whole sort of Me Too thing going on, kids eating Tide Pods, I found that my friend Rob Weinhold who was a really great crisis manager for CEOs. This is the guy that people call when it's like, okay, there's a tape of this thing that happened five years ago and I, it's gonna come out because the guy's blackmailing me. They call Rob Weinhold. So hmm. he talked about crisis management and how you can turn yourself around from in a crisis in a business. Um, I also did a deep dive on learning to cope with instability because I was in the middle of instability and I was seeing a lot of entrepreneur buddies that had gone through the same thing. Uh, I had therapist friends helped me with this problem. I had doctors and I had other people that had been through extreme circumstances giving me advice and I thought I should do a show on this because I'm in it right now and there's a lot of people going through stuff like this right now. So I did a deep dive on that instability. 
And then, of course, we had our Simon Sinek episode. Uh, I had an episode on pre preventing cognitive decline using specific types of foods. That was done by my buddy who's a science writer. Um, I did uh, an episode with Dan Heath, you know, Chip and Dan Heath on how to create moments in a business that are why certain experiences have extraordinary impact both inside and outside yeah. businesses. And I, like I said earlier, I did an episode with Jocko on discipline, um, an episode with a cognitive scientist on influence and how it works in the brain. And I've recently had that money laundering episode and the, the episode that came out today how to spot a psychopath. How to spot, like, yeah, exactly. How to spot a psychopath. And this is from James Fallon, who's a professor of psychiatry and human behavior at the University of California. And the reason he got interested in psychopathy was because he was te testing brain scans of people uh, that were that had other cognitive disorders. And he goes, oh, look, there's a psychopath in this batch. And he goes, wait a minute. This batch is, is – the control group of people in my family and friends circle. I, mm. I want to find out who this person is because I don't know any psychopaths and we might have to be careful or at least give this person a heads up. So he, he D, I don't know what the word is. He, he made it unanonymous, D anonymized <laughs> this particular subject and it turned out to be himself. Wow. That's turned out crazy. To be yeah. Like yeah. we got a concept of so psychopaths show. and his own phone rings. That was it. I know, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we start the show by looking at some of his past behavior and going, now it all makes sense. You know, and so he's looking at his life retrospectively and going, that's why this thing happened. This is why this relationship is the way it is. This is why these people at work view me in this way. This is why I view these sort of emotional connections in a way that makes me feel like an alien, etc. Because the whole time this brain scientist who studied everything from psychopathy to dementia has found, found that he himself was a psychopath. And so it led to some really interesting theories about psychopathy and how societal factors are what bring out the negative elements of psychopathy and sociopathy. And that might sound like a far cry from business or leadership or practical episodes about body language and discipline, but it really isn't because we turn it into an episode about how to spot potentially a psychopath in your life before they can do harm? Or are you spotting somebody who's a psychopath but actually not dangerous? And we go through those different archetypes and what to look for. And so that episode was freaking fascinating. The, and yeah. so the, the point of this is that the reason I'm looking at this content, it might sound to some people like, wow, there's just this crazy diversity of episodes. There's no running theme, but there is. Every episode in sort of the mission of what we have here Every episode, of course, we study the thoughts, actions, habits of brilliant people, and we teach things to the audience. So we take the, uh, the wisdom from the guest and apply it to the audience. We take the guest's superpowers and deliver it to the, uh, the listening audience. So it's not about the guest. It's about what the guest can teach the listener. And the major theme of the show is that, that every characteristic a person has, every desirable characteristic especially, is a learnable, teachable skill. And to that end, we have worksheets for every episode that have have practical insights that the audience can use right out of the box. So the idea behind this is that every episode has practicals, even if the occasional money laundering type episode, the practical is just being aware of this sort of force in the world that you may not be aware of in a way that's interesting. And so it's been tough to find a through line for the new show, but the through line really is that you are better for having listened to it because you can apply something that you learned right away. Yeah. Who's on your hit list uh, that you want to have on? So, uh, good question. I actually have that open right now. Let me shift to that tab. So if anyone's listening. So I have Senator Barbara Boxer coming on the show mm -hmm. pretty soon. Um, I have... Let's see. Annie Duke, who's a poker professional. Oh, yeah. I've heard of uh, Annie Duke. Who talks Duke, about thinking sure. and betting. Which is, yeah. Um, I have the guy who caught the DEA agent who caught El Chapo coming on pretty soon as well to talk about investigate that investigation itself. Um, and I have a record executive coming on when I go to New York to discuss basically uh, – well, he, his, his stuff is quite interesting. His, his side gig is with a charity – that brings awareness to people that have been imprisoned f for crimes they didn't commit, and especially if they're in prison for life. So it's wow. called the Innocence Project, and that's going to be super interesting. Um, 
But people I have on my hit list that I have not booked yet yeah. are uh, I've got M- Mike Posner, who's a well-known music artist that actually went to high school in my hometown. Mm. Um, I've got Dan Dan Rather, the news broadcaster, uh, who, who I actually wanted to be like when I was a little kid. Mm. Great talk show host, a uh, great journalist, and, and I've got uh, let's see who else. Adam Carolla and Dr. Drew are in the pipeline, and. Oh, man, there's so many great people. David Copperfield, the illusionist, is in the pipeline as mm. well. So we've got some great guests that are in the works, mm. uh, already booked, and some that I just can't wait and that are sort of, I'm sort of on the outside of that bubble. So David Copperfield, if you're listening, check your email. <laughs> if he's listening to Inspired Unsaid, that'd be cool. But uh, <laughs> I was just in Vegas on the side of a, a building. But, um, oh. you know, the other thing with – I want to talk about relationships. You know, content is big. Relationships are obviously big. And, um, you know, a lot of the team, the core team of Art of Charm is still with you. So talk a little bit about what it takes to produce what yes. you produce. Talk right. about the so team. I actually, brought, I actually brought basically the entire team with me. Um, I can't think of anybody that I did not bring with me that I would like to. Uh, there's only one guy who isn't working with me right now that, I, that I'm that i really working hard to hire back. Uh, he's a freelancer, and he can't wait to rejoin us as well. He's just doing the one-off stuff. Uh, Jason Sanderson, one of the best audio engineers around. My other producer, Jason, came with me. The whole marketing, customer service, IT, support team, sales team all came with me as well, which was a, a huge blessing um, because – one of the things I would worry about if I found myself on the outside of a company is how the heck are you going to get your team back? I did not have to worry about that. It wasn't exactly a Jerry Maguire moment, you know, who's coming with me. It was a set of choices that that ended in the inevitable uh, rejoining, uh, of a regrouping, I guess, of the team on the Jordan Harbinger show. But that was important, man. Producer Jason is somebody that is like an in- integral part of the business. And I think every business has these people in the business that are just crucial. You know, they're important to the business. You can't do it without them. You couldn't do Rise 25 without John Corker and vice versa. And even though you guys are business partners, so it's not exactly a, just a team member. It's something a little bit more than that. My team here on the Jordan Harbinger show from marketing to sales, we're a family. We've been together for years and years and years. And so losing somebody like that would be really disruptive and just sad. You know, it'd be a huge bummer and a loss of morale. Luckily, the split, the way the split happened, it was just the business partners that I had with the Art of Charm that stayed in the company, and as well as a handful of freelancers. All of the core team that I needed for the show and for the site and for the products and the live events, they all came with me, which um, is a huge, like I said, a huge blessing. And I know... Um, you know, as far as moving forward, instead of going back after this happened, you rebuilt from scratch, blank slate. Um, talk about what you actually did. I, I just want to talk about the hustle mode, right? Immediately you have to go into hustle mode, uh, adrenaline. You know, I know there's times maybe you didn't sleep or you're sleeping two or three hours a night just to, to do what you need to do. So break down in the beginning on one of those nights, maybe you slept for two hours. What do you actually, I, I love talking about the hustle mode, you know? What were you doing in that grind? Yeah, this year and, that? yeah. Yeah, this year and likely next year are going to be 99% hustle mode, at least the next 18 months. So what's going on is, the first thing I did was, it was like cry, right? And the second thing I did <laughs> was cry was like, some more. Was make a huge spreadsheet. Yeah, cry a little bit more, regroup, wash my face, and get back to that work. Yeah. Um, what I did after that was I made a huge spreadsheet with my wife, Jen, of all of my friends, starting from close friends, going to the sort of outer circles, and then on the outer sort of periphery, people that I could reach out to anytime, some close friends, some less close, but that I knew would be of help no matter what and I ended up with literally hundreds of people and this took a couple of hours to do because it was like bang 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 bang. and I still the list is just continually growing because I go oh right this person that I met at that conference a while ago they're interested in helping or you'll make an introduction to somebody I'll add them to the list and reach out to them so I started 
to reach out to these people and send them emails and messages saying, hey, look, I left the Art of Charm. Uh, actually, you know, starting the Jordan Harbinger show could really use help spreading the word. It's a really, really complex situation. It's really stressful. Uh, any ideas that you have, I'm open to. I'm also open to the idea of just catching up. And a lot of people are like, sure, man, if you want to vent or something, cool. Not a big deal. Um, otherwise, I have, you know, A, B, C, D idea. And then other people who host podcasts and things like that or do video shows were like, here, come on my show or talk about this or come on my YouTube channel. And so we had a lot of people like that that were going to be really helpful that have been really helpful and reaching out to those people, getting on the phone, creating collaborations, um, introducing people to each other in my network that I thought could help each other. Cause that never gets a rest as well as deciding which guests I wanted to interview for the Jordan Harbinger show, scheduling those, reading those guests books. You know, each guest that I interview takes six to 10 hours of prep. So I was working hard on that as careful. well. Yeah. About who you, who you have on for that reason. Right. I got to I got to be careful about who I have on. But also I can't just not do the prep for shows because I'm busy with other areas of the business. The audience isn't going to care. Remember what I said about having to earn every minute of their attention. Nobody's going to go, wow, the last 20 shows have been pretty mediocre, but that's OK. You're really busy setting up a website. Nobody's going to care. They just they have what I wanted and what I've gotten so far is for people to say, wow, I used to listen to the Art of Charm and the Jordan Harbinger show is actually much, much better. I can hear it in your voice. I can see it in the guests. I can see the preparation has even improved. The process has improved. The audio quality has improved. The website's better. There's all, all kinds of things that have improved with the Jordan Harbinger show that I, I had to work really hard to get done, all while creating a new website, creating a new product, creating live training, uh, training my customer service team, training my sales team, training my uh, business partner and myself to get the new business off the ground, new branding, new website. I mean, these are things you have to do, and these are the things you have to do in addition to the performance element of creating a great interview and a great show. You can't just, like I said, there's no excuse in the mind of the consumer or of the audience that says, hey, look, Jordan half-assed this one because he's busy with other things. That can't happen. So I just had to do twice as much work. That's all. Yeah, so. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Twice More than twice as much, but in the hustle mode, you started off, you made a list of people, but you know, one of the things that I found uh, very interesting is, and not everyone does it, um, is when you went to reach out, you were very vulnerable. You were very vulnerable with just saying the, the, what was going on with the situation and your thought and emotion around it. I don't know if everyone would be that open about what was going on. They may have said, you know, I'm transitioning. You know, you could have framed it a lot of different ways and you chose just to let it all air. Was that tough to do um, or did it just, I'm just going to lay it all out there when you decide to reach out to, to people? I'm sorry. And, can, can you can you repeat that? It yeah, broke up a little bit. I was saying, um, you know, when you went to reach out to people – you were really vulnerable. You were really honest with what was going on. Um, was that difficult? Um, because you could have framed it as, yeah, I'm kind of transitioning. It just didn't work out. I'm kind of transitioning this new thing instead of telling people really what happened, which, you know, it's, it's almost like the rug was lifted up, uh, up under you. So talk about like the, your decision to be like really vulnerable with what happened. Yeah, this was really tough for me because I actually wasn't sure that I should say anything about leaving the Art of Charm, but there was a lot of, you don't want to leave the narrative up to one side, mm. and the narrative on one side was, this is an amicable split, everything is fine, and I thought, okay, that's fine for now as long as we work out the deal that we had negotiated for that amicable split in December, and that isn't what happened. And I thought, you know, I'm going to get a lot of support if I can tell people, look, this we were terminated. The whole team was terminated. This wasn't my idea. This is not an amicable split. And if I just say, oh, I'm leaving to start my own thing, people will say, oh, well, he's got a ton of resources. He's got a whole team. He's got a bunch of people behind him. He'll be fine. This is a choice. You know, he was ready for this leap. But I, I decided to be more vulnerable with it and, and tell people the truth, which is that everybody was terminated because that would allow me to say, hey, look, I actually need your help. Not just, hey, I have this new thing I'm doing. I could use the help, but I got kicked in the teeth 
and I need help from my friends and business yeah. colleagues right now. That stuff is important because people needed to realize, in my mind, people needed to realize the urgency and the situation that I was going through so that they could say, oh, I've been through this before or wow, I don't envy you, this is really bad. I'm gonna help you where I can. And so it wasn't about playing victim per se. That's not a good thing that's not how I like no. to roll. But it was more about, it was, it was kind of like this. I can either pretend that everything's fine and maybe I'll keep a little bit more of my like image as this untouchable entrepreneur guy, which isn't important to me at all. Um, or, and I, and I might have a five year recovery period, right? Where I have to rebuild everything. I'm not getting that much help except for my closest confidants who I'm mentioning this to and they're helping us out and blah, blah, blah. Or I can tell everybody what happened and I can have an 18 plus month recovery that actually involves a team effort both inside and outside the company from my friends that involves a push where people are thinking of us in this particular time where where I really need the help. And so yeah. I decided to forego looking like an untouchable bulletproof kind of guy and not worry about that and worry more about the real the reality on the ground which is getting things going again and making sure that this stuff works. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's important point is well, you control the narrative. Right. If you don't give them the full information, people just kind of make up what they think or and it's not the truth. And and what I, you know, I love talking about this, Jordan, and I find it fascinating because when you're back, when anyone's back is against the wall, you do what you should be doing all along. And I think every piece of this is a lesson to I mean, a lesson to someone they can utilize right away, whether it's. I mean, maybe it's not being vulnerable about not everyone's going to lose their business is going to come out from under them, but vulnerable about some small piece that they're not sharing that they could be with someone else. You know what I mean? So I think every mm -hmm. step of the way, there's a lesson. And um, what about, so you make the list, you start reaching out to people, guests, and then people who can help. What are you, what else are you doing in the hustle mode to build this back up? What else am I doing in the hustle mode? I'm reaching out to a bunch of folks and friends for help. I'm reaching out to potential guests for the show. I'm reaching out to uh, attorneys and making sure that everything is set up on the ground in a proper way. I'm also rebuilding infrastructure. You know, you have to set up a new YouTube channel. You have to set up new business entities, bank accounts. Um, you have to set up new social media and get that going because that's just a pure function of time. You know, if you're not going to spend a million dollars on ads for Instagram, you've got to start a new Instagram. You know, I had to start that separately. I had to start uh, a new Twitter because I've been using the Art of Charm Twitter and now I'm at Jordan Harbinger on Twitter and Instagram. I had to start those. So I had to give that to my new fans so they could engage with me. Um, also, surprisingly enough, and a lot of people think this isn't a big deal, but it is in my opinion, uh, that there are I answered a lot of my fan mail and my email coming in from people because I don't want people to think that I'm inaccessible just because I'm busy starting a new business. And I don't want people to think that there's some barrier between me and them. I want to be more accessible to my fans and listeners. I want to become more uh, conversational on social media. So I had to make sure that that was all in a row. So there's just an endless amount of work. You know, I also... Uh, I think when people get really busy with stuff, they decide, okay, I can only do what's crucial right now. And I agree with that sentiment, but I've seen people whose businesses hit hard times and they say, I've got to cancel all my speaking gigs because I'm too stressed or I'm not rested, or I need to cancel all these meetings with potential business opportunities. Some of those might be true. Some of that may be indeed the case. However, the uh, idea behind this uh, behind me not doing that, you know, me continuing to go to speaking gigs, me continuing to go to networking events and conventions and things like that is you don't want to become less accessible. You want to be able to deliver your message wherever possible and maintain the relationships that I had built before. So I was always a big networker and relationship manager. I always reach out to people uh, all the time. Now's not the time to crawl in the hole and say, I'm too busy for this. Now's the time to go out there and get everything going you know, in, in your business and making darn sure that you see every single person that you think 
you can help, that can help you, that you're friends with. You got to make sure that you see every single thing. You need to see every single thing. And you know, you know you're that's, managing, that's exactly what that looks you're like. You're managing thousands and thousands of relationships. And I know we talked about before we started about there are certain systems you've set in place for managing the relationships. Can you talk a little bit about some of those systems that what you use? Sure. Sure. So which systems, are, are, like, you mean like the software yeah, like that, that so I use? Exactly. Yeah. It could be software. Or it could just be a system yeah, of, so, you know, every Tuesday I, you know, text these people or something like that. Oh, definitely. Sure. So you and I are both fans of Contactually. You know, every Monday I set aside an hour or so to go through my dashboard in Contactually and reach out to the people who are in the different buckets. So I have 90-day buckets, 45-day buckets, show guest buckets, things like that. Uh, I also have the this practice that I do every day, which is I look at the I scroll down in my texts to the bottom of my phone, and I. <clears throat> you know those people at the bottom of your phone in the texts program are people that like you haven't talked to in two years, right? They're just old text threads from something a million years ago. I will actually go through and text those people and say, hey, it's been a long time. It's been a minute. What are you up to? No rush on the response. I know you're really busy. Haven't spoken to you in a long time. By the way, this is Jordan Harbinger. And, you know, you need to add that because some some people go through and delete contacts if they haven't spoken with you in a long time. And you don't want them to go, huh, I'm embarrassed to admit I don't know who this is, so I'm not going to reply. <laughs> or you want to avoid the, you know, new phone, who is this kind of answer. And so I always just say who <laughs> I am and I always say no rush on the reply right. so that they don't feel obligated. So I'll go through and every day I'll te text two or three of those people, um, depending on how much time I have. And a lot of them never reply. That's fine. But uh, a lot, most of them do. And so you start these conversations with people who go, oh, my God, I haven't heard from you in a long time. And I even text the people whose numbers aren't saved because I'll look through the threat thread and I'll go, oh, this is some person who went out to lunch with me and a group of other people. And they replied in the group thread like, yeah, we're going to Cafe Gratitude. See you all at one. And I realized, oh, I haven't saved this person's number. And I'll just send a quick text like, hey, it's been a while since Cafe Gratitude. How you doing? hope everything's great. I don't ask them for anything. It's just a basic, basic, basic sort of re-engagement strategy that requires very little time, yields these great responses. And I also do something called Gmail roulette. And, um, and that's sort of where I log into my Gmail. And if I'm waiting for somebody to call me or something like that, I might just type in, in the search box, one or two letters of the alphabet mm. and you know, it'll pop up suggestions. Love that. And usually I don't recognize the person's name in there because there's a lot of fan mail in there um, from just random listeners to the show. Sometimes I'll email those people, but usually I'll wait until I see someone's name I recognize. So I might type in like J E and it's like, Oh, do you mean Jeremy? And I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll open that. I'll just hit enter and it'll start composing an email or it'll find the last thread for you, depending mm. on if I'm the compose window or if I'm the search window. And I'll just be like, hey man, standing here waiting for my Starbucks, thought I'd shoot you a note. How's yeah. everything going? You know, how's Inspired Insider going? How's Rise 25? And I'll just fire it off. And I'll hear my name called at Starbucks and I'm on my way. And that stuff is really, really good because it requires just no time at all. You're already in your email clicking refresh for the 80th time and there's just nothing in there, you know, at all that, that matters. So, um, I'm using that time to reach out to other yeah. people. Uh, to, Gmail to do roulette, this. and I, I think it's very, very good. yeah. Gmail roulette. Yeah. Um, and, and another thing is blank slate content, blank slate team. You built that blank slate business, right? You could choose what kind of business model, what kind of products. So, what have you decided so far? I know you have some. Uh, if uh, by the time they listen to this, you'll have some live events available. What kind of things can people um, expect and get from Jordan Harbinger show? Sure. So there is a, a lot of networking, relationship building advice. There's a lot of nonverbal communication, persuasion, and influence advice on the Jordan Harbinger show. I've interviewed people like Larry King to talk about conversational skills. I've interviewed military generals, CEOs of big companies to talk about how they make tough decisions. CIA agents come on and talk about how to read people, get information out of people. Um, like I said, every episode has a worksheet. That stuff's really important to me so that the listener you know, can always use something right away. Um, we also have 
a set of missions for networking outreach, similar to the the texting thing I talked about, the Gmail roulette, but I go into a lot more detail and that's at advancedhumandynamics.com. Uh, you can also find a link to it on the jordanharbinger.com website. But if you go to advancedhumandynamics.com, there's a, a challenge or set of challenges right on the website. And those are just brilliant for Damn, networking I love that relationship name. development. I love that name. So how long Advanced did... Human Dynamics. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Um, so we'll link that up, advancedhumandynamics.com. And that's where people can find some of these these missions and more in-depth information. What kind of form will they be in? Are they like different courses or... Yeah, so advancedhumandynamics.com is going to have our online products, which are going to have to do with relationship development. There's actually going to be a bunch of them. We have an, an app coming out as well, a learning app, and it's just going to have dozens and dozens of little audio lumens and units and products in there. Also, it's where we're going to have our live events. So we're teaching a lot of military and special forces. We're teaching a lot of corporations, but we're also teaching individuals, of course, uh, our live events. And so there's plenty of things that these folks can can learn from us. And uh, I highly, but you know, you're, look, you're listening to a podcast right now. Go check out the Jordan Harbinger Show. I'd love for that to happen. And if people are interested in networking, relationship development, and they want to sort of take drills and exercises and use those, um, whether they need baby steps or they just need reminders or some new ideas, the, the challenges and missions at advancedhumandynamics.com are going to be where it's at. That's going to be really useful for people. So what are you thinking? Talk about uh, what are you thinking about the live event piece? What do you, uh, what's on the, the, the whiteboard? So these, these, yeah, so these are our workshops. They're going to be starting in July and August of this year. These are workshops where we take a lot of, there's a lot of, let's see, drills, exercises, of course. Uh, it's less sort of, it's a lot less sit down and take notes and a lot more hands on. So we're keeping the groups relatively small, although the military and some of these corporations that we're teaching, uh, that's not an option. So we have to scale for them. Um, but when individuals come through, we really do teach verbal and nonverbal communication, uh, networking and relationship development, persuasion, influence, and things like that, that are highly useful, highly prized in the personal and professional spheres. And uh, I'm excited for it because I've run a lot of workshops like this in the past and now I get to finally own the company that is doing this and I think it's going to be really fun. So how did you meet Rob who we were talking a little bit about uh, before we started? Yeah. And what Rob, Rob what's Rob is role? A, Rob is, is a head of marketing and he's doing marketing and sales for almost 20 years, probably longer if you count businesses he's had where he wasn't the head of marketing and sales. Uh, and he's had he's got a distributed team all over the world that I've been working with for a while. And I met him, of course, through a connection, through a relationship that he originally didn't want to work with us. Uh, Why? And we had convinced him to work with us. Now we Why have a really he? close friend of mine. He didn't want to, he just had too many he had too many opportunities yeah. on the table at the time. He had just had way too many opportunities on the table. And he also didn't like some of the past branding that we'd had. Mm. Um, but he, he, him and I started to get along really well over the past few years. And so now him and I are finally starting something from scratch instead of working around other companies or other sort of uh, – groups and, and projects that have already been in existence before. So it's, it's, it's exciting because I get to finally start something from scratch, from the ground up with somebody who knows what they're doing, which is an opportunity that I don't think I've ever had before. So it wasn't too much of a convincing because that other branding and, and stuff was, was non-existent or did it take some convincing because of the other opportunities on the table? Uh, it, it, it took some convincing because of the other opportunities on the table. Now, though, this time around, he was very keen on starting something with me because we've been close friends for so long. So that's the power of the network, man. You know, you get to know somebody and you don't even work with them, but you just they're you know, you're bouncing around, hanging out with them, having a beer here and there, helping them find business for their own separate enterprise. And then they eventually say, hey, look, let's do something together. And you go, sure, why not? You, you happen to fit perfectly well with what I'm trying to do. And uh, that's really exciting for me. You know, a lot of people think, what? You just got so burned by your former business partners. This doesn't make any sense. Why would you ever get a partner again? And I, I want to emphasize, you can't do everything yourself. 
And so you shouldn't seek to do that. You should seek to work with great people. You should seek to protect yourself in business. But you, it's kind of like people who date and then go through a breakup and say, I'm never dating again. <laughs> we all kind of know that's not the answer. Right, right? right. We all know that that's not the reason. That's not the answer to, to how you do this. So you have to pick the right partners. You have to pick people who are fair, just, hardworking, interested in what you're doing. Um, but you want to make dang sure that you're not just isolating yourself and trying to do it all on your own because it'll just be it'll be too hard. You you won't have anybody to lean on. Um, and look, you can do certain things only on your own. That's fine. And you always should have things that you own outright. But the idea that you should never work with anyone else, trust me, if there's anyone who's going to take a lesson like that away from recent events, it's me. But I really don't think so. I really believe in the power of working with great people. And I don't think that there's any experience that should sour you on that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's a good analogy. You're never going to date again. But um, the it, so the, the present piece, it's amazing what you've done in a short period of time. And you'll continue to just have the exponential growth. Um, but um, I want to talk a little about the past. And I don't like... When I thought about this, Jordan, I was like, "How? what can we talk about? And people obviously don't know what happened, how it happened. For me, I'm more curious on, you know, what are you going to do differently? You know, how there's certain things that happened because they were set up probably over a decade ago. And so I'm curious more on how are you going to set it up differently this time because of your experience of what happened, you know, with basically having everything kind of pulled out. Uh, so the, the way that I'm structuring things this time, I'm owning a lot of the IP that I create outright, like the show, the show feed. I manage the team directly, uh, for the projects that I control. Um, I get percentage ownership with buyback agreements that are very fair towards the content creator on things that we create jointly and anything that's created jointly if one party wants out, the other party has the essentially right of first refusal. So if I create an online product with Rob and I don't want to sell it anymore, I don't just get to spike it. I have to agree with him that he will pay me out over time um, and or buy me out for a lump sum. Because what happens in other companies often is you create something jointly, you both own it, which means that if one party is disgruntled, the thing is just vapor. You can't, no one can use it. It's just wasted. And so this ends up being more fair because somebody can buy the other party out and continue to sell that product or run that event, or you get paid a royalty. And that works great for products where one party does not have to continue doing the work because it's already been created. Um, for live events and things like that, obviously, if one party no longer wants to run that event, they no longer have to do the work. So the other party can continue to market that event, but they're not going to force me to go and teach it if I don't want to teach it. So that sort of that problem sort of solves itself. So branding wise, those things are owned jointly. Um, but again, the other party has a right of first refusal, has a right to buy the other party out. Um, and you have to really think of things like that because you don't want waste. That's just it's a really it's really a shame when you see something that took a year to create just end up not being used anymore or somebody else taking it over and not doing a good job with it is always a problem. So, you know, sometimes there's always the inevitability or I should say the possible uh, outcome that something will happen in the future that's going to change the course of the business. All we can do is hope that it's not a downward, uncontrollable spiral. But that's why you diversify income streams, which is another thing that I'm doing. Speaking, the podcast, the advertising revenue, uh, teaching, online products, all of those things under different umbrellas so that if something does happen to one, you're not out in the cold saying, how do I deal with this? You know, And that's extremely important to me. Probably your background as a lawyer helps a little bit, right? Yeah, that helps a little bit. Um, but, you know, a lot of times being an attorney, you can draft a contract, you can read a contract, but it doesn't mean you're going to go sue someone because it's free. You know, they're still still got to hire litigators, still got to expend resources doing it. So I, I want people to know that, you know, you think, oh, I'm an attorney. This isn't going to happen or I'm, I'm do doing a business partnership with an attorney. We're all good. If anybody tries to do anything, you're never going to be quite bulletproof. Yeah. So Jordan, anything else? Um I, I, some of those things um, I'd rather, you know, that's why I like you talking moving forward as a part of what things you're implementing and to, as opposed to kind of all the, the crap that happened um, and probably had been coming to a head. But um, moving forward to the what's going on with the L.A. Weekly. Tell me about that. 
Uh, yeah. So right now I'm looking at a deal with LA Weekly. Can't talk too much about it. Um, I may be doing a show for them. Still all up in the air. Mm. And that would be pretty cool. I'd love to be freelance hosting a show that's completely outside my normal realm. You know, I don't normally talk to, to entertainers and things like that. So the LA Weekly show would be something that has to do with that. Hopefully, if we can get an agreement together, you know, that's always... Uh, that's always a, a potential sort of downfall. Whenever the corporate people get together, they've always got these, you no, know, this has to happen, that has to happen. So I'm not holding my breath for anything like that. So um, first of all, Jordan, thank you. Thank you for just doing what you do You're with welcome. the relationships and your podcast. Uh, you know, I love listening to it when I, I don't listen to many podcasts, but um, yours I do listen to on an infrequent basis. Um, especially when it's the word psychopath in the title, then I'm compelled to listen to it. But um, everyone should check out the Jordan Harbinger show. Uh, it's a Jordan. It's a JordanHarbinger.com. You could check it on iTunes, and, and where else can they check it out on the Android? Uh, Castbox is a great place to listen to podcasts. Uh, I'm also on Spotify. The Jordan Harbinger Show, Castbox. Uh, on Android is a great way to do it, or any podcast app, The Jordan Harbinger yeah. Show. And um, advancedhumandynamics.com is where those missions are. So before we end, I always like to ask Jordan, since it's Inspired Insider, I always like to know um, kind of the low moment and how you push through. And at this point, what's been like a proud moment milestone? And the the low moment may be obvious and maybe not obvious. Um, what's been... A low moment for you in the business or specific point in time in the business? Oh, I mean, just the anxiety of restarting from scratch, you know, losing sleep, the legal drama, which is just essentially a giant waste of time designed to cost one side money. It's just like bit petty bickering, really. Um, and that seems kind of nonstop which is fine. It just goes to the territory. And like you said, I'm a lawyer, so I worry far less about this than I think a lot of people would, especially when someone's like, I'm going to sue you for this. It's like, you have no claim. Go, go, <laughs> go home. Um, that's, but it's still a waste of time. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of energy uh, to be under fire, you know, but the anxiety that comes with restarting and wondering, can I do this? You know, again, I spent 11 and a half years building the art of charm from scratch. Can it be redone? How long is it going to take? You know, but so far with the, the millions of downloads that I've gotten on the show in the past couple of months, that has been a huge inspiration, a very big confidence booster, I, I might say, uh, letting me know that, look, we're going to make it. You know, this is going to happen. We'll be just fine. And then on the flip side, what's been a proud moment at this point? Proud moment, relaunching, relaunching the show and getting hundreds and hundreds of pieces of mail from people saying, it's about time you left that limiting brand, mm. can't wait for the new show, the new direction, this is going to be the best thing that's ever happen, happened to you. And then through the anxiety, really seeing what other entrepreneurs and fans have said, which is, hmm, this may actually be the best thing that's ever happened to me. There's a, I, before when people say it, you don't believe them. But once you start to, to sort of filter through the clouds, you get through the crunch um, a little bit anyway, you start to say, it's not right now, but I'm starting to see that in the future that might actually be the case. And that's that's been hugely inspiring. Totally. And uh, who should we give a shout out to as far as I know a lot of people have been very helpful um, is just, you know, when you reached out and, and helping uh, kind of relaunch, you know, it's kind of a, a community effort. Who's been uh, especially helpful to to helping? Uh, you, you have, of course. I didn't say Corcoran. that to mention me. But um, yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, has been really helpful. Hal Elrod and Vanessa Van Edwards has been super helpful. People know who that is. My friend Margo Aaron, Garrett Gunderson, Dan Martell. Um, John Levy, my friend Gabriel Mizrahi. Man, I have a list of just hundreds of people. Thousands. Norm Pat is, of course, yeah. in Podcast One. There's just been so many people. And, and, of course, all the listeners of the Jordan Arbinger Show have been super interesting to hear from because a lot of them are very excited about this next chapter. It almost seems like I'm the person that's like, 
the least excited about it somehow, you know, because <laughs> I'm in the thick of it. Everybody else is more excited for me than that's I am. That's great. So I think that's kind of funny. Well, thanks, Jordan. Everyone check out jordanharbinger.com and his podcast, The Jordan Harbinger Show. Jordan will be the first one. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate it, man. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.